Well, pro football is uh, four weeks into its season. Crowds are back. Ratings are pretty strong. And the financial machine that is the NFL uh, seems to be running at full steam. So what is the financial state of the game, both in the short and the long term? A pleasure to welcome back to Wharton Business Daily, noted sports agent Lee Steinberg. Hi, Lee. How are you? Hello. Doing great. So from your view, is this league as strong as ever right now? Oh, it's as strong as it's ever been, and the future is even brighter. Uh, in the midst of a cratered economy with the pandemic, they were able to negotiate a contract with Fox and CBS that went up 83%, and a contract with ESPN that went up by a quarter. And this is for the next 10 years. So they have locked in amazing profitability just from television rights. Uh, the crowds are huge and lively. There are so many ancillary revenue streams now between gambling and fantasy uh, sports and internet sites, memorabilia and merchandise is going crazy. So this country is really obsessed with pro football. It's not only the most popular sport by three to one in reader polls, it's the most popular television show. And so 71 out of 100 of the Nielsen top rated shows were all uh, NFL football. What is that going to mean most likely for the players and, and, and I guess their salaries? Uh, you've obviously seen it firsthand with one of your clients, Patrick Mahomes. They're going to go up and they'll continue to rise. There's no bubble here to burst because as long as television networks use loss leader economics to bid on the package, meaning that it's so valuable to be able to show the games and show the promos for the Monday night, uh, Monday through Friday primetime lineup, that that. They're just not rational bidding. Um, I remember when Les Moonves came out after uh, buying Thursday Night Football, and he said, well, congratulate me. I've just signed up to lose $100 million. <laughs> We're joined by Lee Steinberg, noted sports agent, talking about the, uh, the state of the National Football League. You mentioned about the TV contract. Uh, and it's amazing, as you said, the numbers that were signed in that deal. And you, you seem to have whether it's at the league level, but it also at the team level, all of these different avenues to be able to make money these days. And, and gambling is obviously part of it. Uh, podcasting, you know, different video content. There is all of this different element that just keeps bringing extra revenue into the league right now and into the sport. So football had the great benefit of growing up with television. And so the camera angles and production values are wonderful. It's a once a week event, so people can get excited about it. There's only 10 home games, so there's scarcity. And uh, it fits the timing and taste of the American public right now. When I was growing up, it was baseball, but now pro football dominates and right behind that is college football. What's your expectation then uh, for uh, the remainder of this year? Uh, because from a league perspective, they have to feel very happy that they have fans back in the stands. Obviously, last year did not in the pandemic. But I guess from a business perspective, even though they lost money, they still got the games played. They got them on TV. And that, I think, is probably the, 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 the most important element for them, is it not? And remember that football has not had labor problems like the other sports have had. So since 1987, every game has been played. So putting labor issues aside, it allows everyone to concentrate on growing the pie. So whether it's a NFL network or a new virtual reality uh, project with Patrick Mahomes, where you put on the headset and he um, you now become the quarterback in Arrowhead Stadium. You hear the crowd noise predicated on what you do with a football. You can either throw an uh, interception or get sacked, or you can throw a touchdown pass, and it feels real. There are so many ways to bring fans closer to sports experience. There are new leagues where the fans go ahead and um, – put some money in and then they get to vote on who the coaches are and who the lineup is and it's played in a studio. There are clever new ways to continue to uh, find ancillary revenue streams.
and probably no surprise at all that uh, even with the pandemic last year, the valuations of the teams did not go down at all. No, and they'll continue to go up. Again, uh, remember the sport is salary capped. So it means that it's a fixed formula of roughly 53% to owners and 47% to players. So it means there's a cap on costs in a salary cap and therefore they're guaranteed profitability. And the only way that salaries can rise is if gross revenue uh, rises and it is rising. And so next year, the salary cap will, will see a big boost and players will be better paid than ever. Well, and there have been disputes over what that percentage was going to be, what the owners would get and what the players would get. Are we kind of at a point right now where there's a little bit of harmony in that, in that region? Well, I think very much so. And uh, the contract got done for another 10 years to collect a bargaining agreement without any talk of a strike, without uh, any disruption. And, and see, at the end of the day, I always tell owners, our real battle is not labor versus management. Our battle is with every other form of discretionary entertainment spending. So the battle is with the NBA and Major League Baseball and Home Box Office and Netflix and Walt Disney World for every form of discretionary entertainment spending. And, and football has done a marvelous job of keeping the business away so you're not alienating fans and you're not pushing them away. Fans have very little sympathy if someone's complaining because they're only making $8 million instead of the 12 they want or millionaires and billionaires uh, collectively bargaining. You've been around uh, at the NFL and pro sports for a long time. And now we're at a time where uh, gaming is a big part uh, of the sport. It's always, ha always has been, but now it's literally tied to the sport. Did you ever think you'd see a day where, where we'd be talking about having, uh, you know, betting companies as sponsors and, and, and all of this activity? No, that always was the last sacred cow that any association of gambling where a player might somehow run up a debt and then game gets fixed and all of a sudden you're talking about not an even lane, uh, playing field, but you're talking about wrestling. So uh, right now people have the confidence the games are played on an even field with the same rules with everyone trying and therefore it creates amazing betting uh, concepts. But this happened so fast, all of a sudden we went from no sports in Las Vegas to uh, having uh, two teams there. We went from no association with betting to having uh, Indian casinos uh, as advertisers to have sports owners and leagues get involved in fantasy like DraftKings. Um, this happened with remarkable speed. And now I think you'll see parimutuel betting, just like at the horse track, uh, when ultimately when you get, go to a game. Well, yeah, I, I was going to say that seems to be the next step for a lot of these companies is not only just being able to bet on the game, but being able to bet on what's going to happen on particular plays and, and who might score the most touchdowns in the game to, to be able to break it down even more than what it is right now. You know, bettors are uh, so excited about betting that they'll bet on who wins the opening toss, who receives the first, um, who gets the first first down, who they can break a game into micro components that would stun you uh, with all the possible wagers. So um, it's, it's why sometimes when a game is out of hand and you're at the end of it and you hear fans madly cheering with a, with a touchdown that doesn't matter, <laughs> it's point spread. Hey, while we have you here, uh, I, you, I do want to get your take on uh, the rules and the uh, advent of name, image, and likeness in college sports and the impact that it's having now and it may have in the future. Well, first of all, it's, it's uh, revolutionized college sports in a way that's never been seen before. It's only been going since July, but we signed, our firm signed Spencer Rattler, the Oklahoma quarterback for name, image, and likeness, Malik Willis. And basically what you're seeing is that football programs across the country, the 
quarterbacks are the lead beneficiaries, but there are situations where Phil Knight's offering every player on the team an endorsement or various companies every, so the depth of it is amazing. I'm in Hawaii now and uh, the quarterback at the University of Hawaii did a deal with the bank. Well, it was announced above the fold on the front page of the uh, local newspaper. And then you turn to sports and it's the front news story. So clearly there's branding and uh, it's also being used for recruiting. So when you see Nick Saban, uh, instead of saying, no, 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 he's an amateur saying, oh, he's got a million dollars in, in endorsements for Bryce Young. Um, you know that, that the schools that do the most vibrant, who have the biggest uh, alumni base and the greatest uh, fans, you know, it's, it's, it, it could keep players in school longer because instead of having to make a draconian choice between scholarship and, and um, pro riches, they all of a sudden can make the money on campus. But the only troubling aspect of it is that um, take Patrick Mahomes, his first two years, we didn't advise him to do any endorsements because he hadn't proven himself on the field yet. And you didn't want to put undue pressure. So all of a sudden, um, high school players going to college can have marketing agents and they never played it down. How has it changed your working relationship, relationship in and around college sports? Because if you go back, you know, 10, 20 years, the relationship had to be, you know, structured in such a way and at a certain period of time, this is obviously a little bit new for you as well in working with, with college athletes. At that age, it's very much new. Uh, so in baseball, we've had clients that are coming out of high school into the draft, but in football, you would wait until someone's junior year because that's when they were eligible for the draft. Now, all of a sudden, um, you'll have... Um, agents looking, uh, hanging around at hospital maternity wards looking for healthy mothers. So uh, it speeds up the whole situation because even though the NIL deal specifically says that the marketing agent is not the agent for pro sports, um, assume that if the marketing agent does a good job, most of these firms are also people that uh, represent professional athletes. So it moves the competition point for uh, a young player much earlier than ever uh, was before. And uh, again, it's it really is a revolution. And it's long overdue because players on the campus felt ripped off. They couldn't work during the school year to supplement their uh, scholarship like other non-athletes could. And they might live at a lower standard of living. And then they went into the stadium and saw it packed and read about the TV contracts and saw their jersey in the student store. So I think it's got the potential to, to take a whole series of payments made to players under the table and have them made over the table in plain sight. So what do you say to people, though, that do have concerns that what we used to see in the 60s, 70s, and 80s may come back in a different form now here in, in, the, in the 2020s. Well, you have all sorts of uh, approaches to this. You have actual campuses that are handling this for the athletes. You have private companies who are uh, handling this. And as long as parents are involved, uh, protective parents, then the discussion is very much the same as when we would talk to someone three years later. So you're actually getting past the screening of the parents. So the, the players that have good parental structure or the help of a university will do quite well. The people that athletes who try to do it on their own may be, end up with the wrong people. I, and let me ask you a final question in and around that because in having talked with you a couple of times and, and seen some of the uh, the press around how you work with, with uh, athletes, it seems like that relationship part of it is a very, very important component to have kind of a, a family feel to how you work with, uh, with your athletes. 
It is, and you, the key skill here is listening. It's the ability to draw out a family and a young man and understand how they feel about short-term economic gain and long-term economic security and family and, and being a starter and, and geographical location. And then designing a holistic plan for them, we ask that they retrace their roots to the high school, collegiate and professional uh, places that help shape them and set up scholarship funds and, and charities and the rest of it. So you're looking for a certain type of, um, of uh, play. And the parents are very involved, especially through the first part of the uh, process. And they've got been prepared by Players Association and other people with some very uh, tough questions. You probably could be confirmed for Secretary of State or Defense, you know, going through one of those sessions.